I don't really know who I am. They called me Fernando Aguirre. In 1994, they elected me president of the IC, and I've been the president since then. 55 flags, 55 surfing nations, all today here. I was born in Mar del Plata, in Argentina. I was raised there with my brother Santiago. We are only two brothers, so we were best friends. I wouldn't be here where I am if it were for my parents and my brother. My mom was from, born from Mar del Plata. She focused on what needs to be done so things happen. And if something was difficult or somebody said, well, this cannot happen, she saw an opportunity. You know, she was the one that would say, you know, that's the road, that's where we're gonna go, we need to go. I was, uh, you know, in Argentina, not being good at playing soccer is like, Okay, it's like you live in Hawaii and you're not good at swimming. No, you got a problem. I was a good student. I was kind of the intellectual brother. My brother was much better than me, you know. By 10 he was playing soccer, rugby, tennis, everything. I wanted to be good at other things, so I focused on other things. I was collecting stamps. Which 10-year-old collects stamps? <laughs> I don't know. Many times I drifted away from the ocean. My brother will be the one that will reel me in back into the ocean. I started as a shy kid, and I finished as a student association leader and a party organizer, so my life changed in those years. In many ways, surfing saved my life and allowed me to, to stay active. I think that as terrible as it was to feel insecure and to be shy, at one point I realized that it was just too painful to be like that, so I wanted to change. Instead of being shy, kind of maybe the pendulum swung too far the other way. But I needed to do something about it, you know. I moved from DJ to organizer of surfing contests, using my music system to play the music that kids wanted and the military had banned. The radios were censored and there were a list of music that you couldn't play. But that was the music that the kids wanted to hear. So I was playing that music on the beach for the surfers. And then a year later, you know, surfing had exploded so much because we have done such a great job marketing surfing. I was the president of the surfing association, Santiago was the president of the skateboard association. So we're running surfing and skateboard contests, sometimes together, you know, on, on a ramp next to the ocean, sometimes separate. And then a year later, my brother comes, he tells me, you know, we're gonna open a surf shop. I said, we're gonna open a surf shop? We don't have money to. We kill it. The first summer we kill it. You know, we're making aloha shirts, board shorts, uh, wax, leashes, we're all making that because nobody was making them in Argentina. Then the next year I came to California in the summer. I went for a, on a four month trip while my mom was running the shop in the winter. I landed in Huntington Beach in 1980. And then whatever I thought about surfing, how surfing was going to be for me completely changed because I arrived to a place in which everybody surfed. The parents, the kids, the carpenters, the workers, the supermarket employees. It was just like, a, it was a surfing society. And then a year later, uh, the economy collapsed in you know, Latin America. And then I got a letter from my brother saying, why well, don't you come to, go to California? We we'll spent some time together. He told me that alone, we were very capable, but together, we were going to do great things together. I said, okay. So I burned my ships on another one with plane ticket. It was just around 4,000 bucks. We started a reef. We focused on making the best sound as we could. But reef was really nothing. For three years, we sold 3,000 pairs and 15,000 pairs. And then for the third year, we started full page advertisements in surfing magazine. And we went from 15,000 pairs to 100,000 pairs. And then we went to 250,000 pairs the next year. I said, okay, now we can make a living selling sandals. We sold it 20 years later. People ask me why I've been involved with humanitarian and environmental organizations and in the highest level with the ISA. It belongs to surfers. Surfers, surfing. It gave me, on the one hand, a relaxed view of failure. <laughs> we all miss a wave. We all get out paddle. But you know, do you get mad and go to the beach? Or you turn around and go for the next wave? We have a, a meeting of the Pan Am Surfing Association and, and we're talking about the elections. There were elections for the ISA to renew the, the executive committee. And somebody says, why don't you run for president? I say, no, because I'm the president of Basa. I say, well, you can be the president of both. 
And I said, I don't know about this. I want to run against an Irish guy that is basically the guy that the Australian, South Africa, and the Americans want to win. And you're going to run and you're going to try to win? I said, yes. So two days later, we have elections and I won in the first round. So barely, but I got the votes. A year later, you know, I had already seek and obtain Olympic recognition of the ISA. And it was impossible to have a chance at the Olympic Games if we didn't have the best athletes, not just the national teams at the ISA. So I realized that it was essential to have the top professionals in their teams. So I started negotiating with the ASP, which the ASP and the ISA didn't talk to each other. It was like a, some sort of animosity against each other. And we strike a deal. And the deal was they would allow their surfers to compete in the national teams. And the ISA will change the name from ISA World Surfing Championship to ISA World Surfing Games. So there will be one world champion at the Open Division. So it was very easy. And in that event, in 1996, I was left. The host that was for 96 was South Africa. South Africa bailed on the hosting a year before. So I have to run the event myself or no event. I said, I mean, I'm asking the IOC to bring surfing and we can't even run a world championship. So I said, I'll run it. So I ran the event in Huntington Beach. And we ran a three podium competition for nine days, including a parade including we were able to secure a letter from President Clinton, the first time a president of the United States welcomed surfers into America to a competition. We created a noise and we created a, an, an ongoing relationship with the professional tour. That meant that in 1998, when we went to Portugal, a city surfer won, Mick Campbell from Australia. So suddenly, things were changing. And my vision, even in 96, was that the national teams would, in, would be the, like the dream teams. You remember like the 19, 1992 Olympics dream team of basketball. It will be dream teams. So it will be like the United Nations. It was a way to bring the world together in a completely different way. It wasn't the professional tour, which was for money. It was something else. And I never thought that of replacing the professional tour. I thought we were adding value. We created the Sands of the World. The Sands of the World was devised as a symbol of bringing the countries of the world together in peace through surfing. You know, the ultimate spirit of that will be when those 40 male and female surfers walk with their national teams in the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. I mean, this is watched by three, four billion people. And now you're parading, you got your flag, your country's call, a person with a flag goes up on stage, a person with the sand goes up on stage, the whole world is looking at you, and you pour the sand, you wave your flag, you make your haka if you're a kiwi, you do whatever you wear, your, your special hats or, or clothing or your green blazer if you're a South African. We got, you know, an, an amazing mix of countries. I mean, here you got Moroccans and Israeli. One Moroccan, one Israeli qualifying at the same time, going up on stage to pour the sand. We're Irish and English. And you see all of that happening. And it's just, for me, it's the most emotional time. You are here because you're a champion. It doesn't matter if you don't win medals. Of course, a few people will win medals, and most people will not win any medals. But you're a champion because you're on your national team. You earn the right to be here. The value we're bringing to their lives and their career is, is amazing. The Olympic movement, by many people, was perceived as changing slowly and after the fact, kind of not going ahead of the game. When in 2013, President Buck, the current president, was selected. He, he knew they had to change. His phrase was, which is an incredible phrase, change or be changed. So one of the things, that the most successful thing that he changed was expanding the Olympic uh, sports program. In 2015, Tokyo could propose to the IOC uh, new sports. I had already reached out to the WSL and I told them that they need to be part of this, that this didn't belong to us. So I invited them to participate. They gave messages committing, the preservers themselves committing to be in Tokyo if we were selected. And with all of that and all everything that we've been doing all these years, we presented our case to Tokyo. 26 new sports presented their case for inclusion. And out of the 26, eight became a shortlist and then five became a shortlist and we were in the five. Tokyo was told, do you care for new sports? Tokyo said, yes. Okay, which one will they be? Surfing. You sport for the ocean and the beach, skateboarding, urban youth sports, and sport climbing, outdoor youth sports. And that was it. In one giant stroke, Bach achieved what hasn't been achieved in decades of evolution of the Olympic program.
I was like, wow, this thing really worked. This is 23 years after being elected president of the ISA, the full dream of the dream teams with the best surfers, professionals and everything coming together and surfing and having a blast together, realizing that the ISA events were actually quite a lot of fun. I realized that for the first time, instead of me pushing for the door to open that wouldn't open, now the door was open and they were waving us to come in. The single most large inclusion of new sports in the history of the Olympic Games. And we're part of it, a big part of it. Surfing is going to be for the first time in the Olympic Games in Tokyo, but the second time is going to be exactly in the opposite end of the world, in Tahiti. Baseball, softball and karate will not be in Paris, 2024 Games. Surfing, skateboarding, sport climbing will be. And the 2028 Games, where are they going to be? In LA. And what is the official sport of the state of California? Surfing. We're only selected for Tokyo, but already confirmed for Paris and very likely we're going to be in 28 in California, in Los Angeles. And in 32? What is the, the front runner for 32? Brisbane, Gold Coast, Australia. I became surfer's ambassador. And that's what I am right now. Getting surfing into the Olympics was really dip diplomacy. And I was able to become a better diplomat because I have next to me Bob Fasulo, which was al already a part of the Olympic world for 25 years in all type of roles, at the National Olympic Committees for the USA, at hosting organizations. But I also hired the best Olympic media guy, which was uh, Mike Lee, an Englishman. He was the best of the best. So I had two of the best guys with me. He was a three-man team. When I grew up, I wanted to be a diplomat. What I learned in, in surfing, by what I learned in business and what I learned with my parents, they all came together. When I was elected president of the ISA, I was happy because I was doing that. I have a business, I was running a business with my brother and I was doing this. But I never thought I was going to be a diplomat. And I became surfing diplomat. We're joined by surfing, we're joined by this event. So it's not just a competition, it's a cultural experience. In the ocean, it doesn't matter who you are. You know, the ocean is like a, it's like a big mother with big open arms and she welcomes anybody that wants to be her child. It doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor, what color skin you have, if you are religious or not religious, what religion you have. It doesn't really matter, they're all together. 